For the next 25 minutes or so, what I'll try to focus on is resistant hypertension, recognition, management, and when to refer. And I'm trying to, this is a huge topic. I'm trying to focus uh, from the perspective of the primary care physician. So as in everything else with medicine, we have an, a, a word soup for hypertension as well. So you, you, use, you throw in all these terms, refractory, uncontrolled, malignant, accelerated, hypertensive crisis, difficult to control, uh, you know, um, hypertensive urgency, or emergency, there's all these terms. So what exactly is resistant hypertension? It turns out that there's a specific definition for resistant hypertension. And anybody I ask, you know, they all know the definition. It's three medications and you're not controlled. But the devil is in the details. It is blood pressure that remains above goal in patients who are adhering to optimal doses of an appropriate three drug regimen of different classes that includes a diuretic. That is the JNC7 definition. Now the AHA, the American Heart Association, goes a step further and they say the blood pressure, irrespective of control, if a patient is on more than three medications, that should still be considered resistant hypertension. The reason they have this arbitrary definition is so that you pay a little more attention to these patients because they may benefit from additional workup. So what is the prevalence of true resistant hypertension? It is unknown because it's, it's difficult to account for medication adherence. It's difficult to account for medication dose, whether they're actually taking the highest tolerated dose. It's difficult to account for me measurement artifacts. So the best estimates we have are from epidemiological studies or large healthcare systems. And those best estimates are between 12 and 16%. Um, that's what we know, or what the best available information is. So I mentioned true resistant hypertension. What is the other part of it? What is pseudo-resistant or apparent resistance? The first thing is improper blood pressure measurement. Now, this happens to be one of the most, uh, at least one of the common causes of patients being labeled as resistant hypertension, and I'll go through that a little bit later. Pseudo-hypertension in the elderly. This happens in those who have really calcified blood vessels, and you really can't compress their arteries, so they obviously end up being labeled as having high blood pressures when that may not be the case. You keep adding medications, and they end up being hypotensive. White coat effect. Now, when we look at the Spanish registry of ambulatory blood pressure measurements, uh, it had 68,000 patients. One third of those in that registry that were labeled as resistant hypertension actually had a white coat effect. So this is the other thing to keep in mind, a white coat effect. And of course, as you mentioned, poor patient compliance. So when do you suspect pseudo-resistance? As I mentioned before, escalating therapy resulting in symptoms consistent with hypotension. Uh, they're not feeling well. Uh, they're lightheaded. They're dizzy. They're falling down. There's no target organ damage despite them coming to your office with blood pressures in the 180s and 190s. Surprisingly, they don't have any target organ damage despite having, quote unquote, high blood pressures for a long time. Now, coming to blood pressure measurement. Now, this is a carton, I think it's an old one from the New Yorker. And other than the humor in it, what I want to really focus on is how not to take blood pressures in this picture, as shown in this picture. This person is sitting down with his, you know, his arm is all bent. Uh, he, it's not at heart level. His legs are dangling. His back is unsupported. The physician taking the blood pressure is chatting away and he is um, scared out of his mind. So that's not the way to check blood pressures. Now, say that you check it correctly. Even in that case, is office blood pressure a true reflection of what the actual blood pressure is? It's just a snapshot of one time this patient comes in to see you, you check a blood pressure. Is that really the true blood pressure? Having said that, that's the best thing we have. So, can we do a good job or a better job of checking blood pressures in the office? So it turns out there are these automated devices that can check multiple blood pressures, which actually in our nephrology department, we have implemented it across the board that everybody who comes in gets this automated device uh, measurement called the BP-True. Uh, basically what it does is 
The first measurement, it takes six readings. So the first reading is taken with the MA, the medical assistant in the room, just to make sure that it's working and it's uh, taking the blood pressure correctly. The medical assistant then leaves the room and the patient is alone. And it takes five more readings at one minute intervals. And the average of the five readings is taken. The whole purpose of this is to decrease that white coat response that may be happening in the office. Now, is this, is this all just anecdotal? No, there is actually a randomized trial uh, from Canada. It's called the CAMBO trial <coughs> with the BP2 device. The BP2 readings were significantly closer to daytime ambulatory blood pressure measurement readings compared to conventional readings. Now, ambulatory blood pressure readings are considered the gold standard for blood pressure measurement, at least at this time. Now, speaking of ambulatory devices, um, again, the gold standard at this point, it's a strong predictor of cardiovascular mortality compared to conventional office blood pressure measurement. Now, you can see all those different uh, readings that it provides. Uh, there's a 24-hour average blood pressure um, right here that if it goes above this, that's considered hypertension. There's a daytime average, about 140 over 90. There's a nighttime average, about 125 over 75. And there's also something else that we look at very carefully. It's called the nocturnal dipping. Do they actually show dipping in blood pressures from daytime to nighttime? Normally, there should be a 10 to 20% dip. And if there's no dip, that has been shown to have independent value in predicting risk of target organ damage. So the 24-hour monitor can provide a whole lot of good information, ranging from daytime, nighttime, and dipping. The problem is this is not available everywhere else. It's not uh, commonly used, or it's just available in tertiary centers. And the other problem is that Medicare only reimburses the diagnosis of white coat hypertension, which is another reason why people may shy away from doing it. Hopefully that'll change with new guidelines that are coming out um, later this year. Um, the other um, possibility, if you cannot get an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, is to ask the patient to do home blood pressure readings. Uh, if they're accurately done or if they're reliable, that's a good way to follow blood pressures as well. Now, coming back to true resistant hypertension, drug-induced, what are the factors associated with that? Drug-induced is, you know, there are some drugs that can affect or interact with medications or cause blood pressure control to be suboptimal. And the most common ones that we see are NSAIDs. If this patient is taking a whole lot of Advil and leave in addition to other medications, it's probably best that they decrease it or cut it out altogether. Volume overload, because their excessive sodium intake, their salt intake is too high, increased processed foods, or they're not on diuretics or on inadequate diuretic therapy. Associated conditions, obesity, obstructive sleep apnea, excessive alcohol intake, all these can interfere with blood pressure control. Now, there's a couple of physician factors as well. One is physician inertia. I know we don't like to hear that, but um, sometimes we're guilty of not making any changes when changes are uh, needed. And inadequate doses of medications or inappropriate drug combinations can be another factor. The last one is secondary causes. Now, anybody with resistant hypertension, you have to think about possible secondary causes of hypertension. Now, I'm not going to go into detail, but this is uh, by no means an exhaustive list, but uh, some of the uh, possible secondary causes of hypertension. What I would like to point out is the most common secondary cause is renal panicomal disease, the most common cause of secondary hypertension. And that's not renal artery stenosis. It's just pure renal panicomal disease, CKD. Now, besides the renal, what we see very often now, at least uh, in our clinics, is patients with adrenal problems, specifically primary aldosteronism. If any patient comes into your office with unexplained hypokalemia, they have been on diuretics for a long time, uh, not recently increased, uh, but they've persistently been hypokalemic, despite taking potassium supplements, or despite being on medications that are expected to raise the potassium, they remain persistently hypokalemic, along with hypertension, you have to suspect a possibility of primary aldosteronism. We have been picking up a lot of people with this condition. Now, patient compliance, it's always difficult to assess. It's subjective, and it could be because of cost. It could be complexity of medications. It could be the side effects that are limiting their um, intake of medications, lack of understanding. 
Some of the clues are, you know, uh, in general, if they keep missing office visits, they're vague about the names of the descriptions of medications or the doses. Lack of physiologic evidence of therapy. For example, if they're on high doses of beta blockers and they're still tachycardic and you have no other explanation, you gotta think about, hey, why, why is this person persistently tachycardic when he's on these high doses of beta blockers? Now, what are the strategies? Ask them to begin their pill bottles. We can call up their pharmacy to find out if they've been filling medications. One easy thing to do is to get a urine diuretic screen. This doesn't have to be a 24-hour urine. It is a, just a spot urine sample. It, it's at the Cleveland Clinic, at least. It's a send-out test. It is sent to, I believe, Mayo or Iowa. The results are returned in 10 to 14 days. It tests for all the common diuretics, uh, hydrochlorothiazide, tortalidone, furosemide. So if these patients haven't been taking it, that diuretic screen is going to come back as negative. Now, the 24-hour urine, I don't expect that any of you will order the 24-hour urine. Uh, that's something that we do. But if you happen to go back in that patient's chart and you find that sometime in the past this patient has had a 24-hour urine done, and you see that 24-hour urine above 100 milliequivalents in 24 hours, that translates to more than 2.3 grams of sodium. Now, this is obviously in a steady state. That patient hasn't been, you know, it wasn't done at the time of increasing diuretics or anything. Assuming a steady state, if you see a 24-hour urine sodium above 100, that would translate into more than 2.3 grams of sodium intake. Observed administration of medications is something we occasionally do, but again, this requires admission to the hospital for a day or two uh, to see what's going on. Now, uh, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the medications. Uh, again, just the main points to consider as far as medications. Diuretics. Uh, diuretics for JNC7, which uh, puts out guidelines for hypertension management. Diuretics are the cornerstone of therapy for hypertension. Thiazide diuretics, usual doses 12.5 to 25. You can go up to 50, but expect increased side effects with those increased doses. Loop diuretics, like furosemide, should be used if the GFR is less than 30. If the GFR is less than 30, thiazides are not going to work. Short-acting loops, like Lasix, have to be dosed at least twice a day. This is one of the most common mistakes that we see. Lasix once a day for hypertension is not going to do anything. It has to be dosed at least twice a day. Now, longer-acting loops can be used, like torsamide, but they cost a little bit more. Now, among the thiazide diuretics, which one is better, chlorothalidone or hydrochlorothiazide? It has been shown that chlorothalidone is more potent, at least two times more potent than hydrochlorothiazide, and it's longer-acting. This one shows, this is a study that shows that it is better than hydrochlorothiazide in lowering 24-hour blood pressures, particularly because of the effect on nighttime blood pressures. It lowers the nighttime blood pressures. So if at all you have a choice, chlorothalidone is preferred over hydrochlorothiazide. The reason we have been uh, accustomed to using hydrochlorothiazide, I suppose, is because those are the ones that are available with uh, combination, fixed combination doses, and pharmacy for whatever reason, has been promoting that all this time. But chlorothalidone is much better to use. Now, on the flip side, there was a recent study um, this year out of Canada that looked at chlorothalidone use versus hydrochlorothiazide use in patients who are 66 and older, and they found that chlorothalidone had an increased incidence of hypokalemia. Now, there are a lot of criticisms of this study, especially because at the end of it, the chlorothalidone dose that they used was higher than 25 milligrams and the equivalent hydrochlorothiazide dose that they used was lower. So it wasn't really an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. But having said that, when you use chlorothalidone, just be cognizant that hypokalemia may be an issue. Beta blockers. Beta blockers are no longer considered first-line therapy. They've gotten a bad rap, partially because all the studies in the past have been using etanolol. And that was used in once daily dosages for most studies and atenolol ideally has to be taken more than once. And then there were more older pa patients for those studies. Beta blockers work better in younger people. Now, if you do use a beta blocker for hypertension, do not go with atenolol. Uh, newer beta blockers are better, specifically Coreg or labetalol because they have dual alpha-beta effect. They have a vasodilatory effect. Or bistolic, nebulol, because that has a vasodilatory effect via the nitric oxide pathway. So if you're going with a beta blocker for hypertension, use the newer ones, which have this combined alpha-beta or the vasodilatory effect. ACEs and ARBs. Um, at one point, it was considered 
good to combine ACEs and ARPs. It's no longer recommended after the results of the on-target trial. These were patients with high vascular risk. What they compared was telmisartan, ARB, or ramipril, ACE, or the combination of the ACE and the ARB. Now, ACE and ARB lowered the blood pressure to an equal degree, and the combination lowered the blood pressure a little more than either, com either one alone, but the combination had an acceptable adverse renal outcomes to the point that the study was stopped. So this combination is no longer recommended. Now, let me make a comment on that. If you see patients who are on it, you don't necessarily take them off of it if they're doing well or if they have been doing well on it for a long time. But if you're thinking about starting somebody on a combination, that may not be advised. Again, these are patients who don't have heart failure, who don't have kidney disease or proteinuria. So there may be other indications for which the combination is indicated. But for hypertension, it's not advised to start them on a combination of ACEs and ARBs. Similarly, direct renin inhibitors, Tecterna, Aliskirin, should not be combined with an ACE and ARB. Uh, this was after the altitude trial, uh, which, uh, follow, which was stopped, and the FDA put out a warning that the combination of Aliskirin or Tecterna with ACEs and ARBs, especially in patients with diabetes, is contraindicated because of risk of renal disease, uh, hypotension, and hyperkalemia. So that's another combination that should be avoided. Calcium channel blockers. Um, Short-acting calcium channel blockers should no longer be used. Um, sublingual nifedipine should be out. Um, the most common side effect that people will come to you with on calcium channel blockers is edema. Now, what is that edema? That edema is not salt and water retention. That edema is arteriolar dilation. So if you think about it, precapillary dilation, there's a capillary and the postcapillary, there's increased hydrostatic pressure, and that's what causes the edema. So diuretics don't help. Increasing Lasix on these patients purely to get rid of edema is not going to work. What are the things you can do? Either switch them to another class of calcium channel blockers, like if you're using amlodipine or nifedipine, you may consider verapamil or dilthiazem, or decrease the dose, or if nothing helps. Adding ACEs, ARBs, or venodilators may help, because again, the post-dilation may um, mitigate some of that hydrostatic pressure. If nothing works, you have to take them off of it. Now, one of the trials that I want to mention is the ACCOMPLISH trial. The reason I want to say that is because this trial used a combination of calcium channel blockers with ARBs and compared it to diuretic with ARB. Now, as I was saying before, diuretics are the cornerstone of therapy, but this particular trial actually showed that a combination of calcium channel blocker with an ARB actually had a better cardiovascular outcome than a diuretic and an ARB. How is this going to play into future recommendations? It may play a big role. When the next uh, set of guidelines come up, this may, the study uh, may be one of the things that they use uh, maybe to recommend calcium channel blockers along with ARBs uh, rather than diuretics. But one thing I want to say, the diuretic that they used in the study was, a, was hydrochlorothiazide. Would chlorothalidone have worked better uh, is open to question. Direct vasodilators, hydralazine, minoxidil. Now, these cause edema because of fluid and salt retention, and they also cause tachycardia. So these patients need diuretics and beta blockers along with these medications. Peripheral alpha blockers, doxazosin, terazosin, they cause orthostatic hypotension, so preferably dosed at night, can be used if they have prostate problems. Now, spirolactone or aldactone. Now, this is something new that is, um, you know, fairly recently that people have begun using this in patients with resistant hypertension who don't have primary aldol. Now, it's commonly used in primary aldosteronism, but this study, this analysis of the ASCOT trial uh, in patients without any evidence of primary aldol, when aldactone was added as a fourth drug, there was a significant drop in blood pressure. Systolic blood pressures dropped by 21 points. So this could be considered in patients with resistant hypertension as an add-on drug, or at least as a fourth drug, in doses between 25 to 50 milligrams. Now, this is especially useful if patients have obesity and obstructive sleep apnea. Now, one thing I would say is if you're considering putting patients on spironolactone, uh, patients with resistant hypertension, I would advise checking a renin and aldo level, um, looking for primary aldo, because once these patients go on spironolactone, it's very difficult to interpret aldosterone levels after they go on it. You'll have to take them out for at least four to six weeks. So it's, uh, from, a, uh, from a practical standpoint, if you're 
starting patients on spironolactone, maybe it's a good idea to check their baseline renin and aldo levels. Now, what is a rational approach to drug therapy? Now, start with, you know, again, resistant hypertension, three drugs. What are the three drugs to use? A standard triple regimen would be a thiazide diuretic, an ACE and an, or an ARB, and a long-acting calcium channel blocker. Now, if they have compelling indications, especially cardiovascular indications, you can use a beta blocker. Um, and instead of the thiazide, use a loop if the GFR is less than 30. As I mentioned before, preferential use of chlorothaladone over uh, hydrochlorothiazide. Now, consider using a, the next step would be if they're still uncontrolled, consider using a vasodilating beta blocker if they have not been on a beta blocker before, the Coreg or Labetalol or Nebivalol. Or consider using spironolactone or eplerinone. Uh, eplerinone, again, is inspra. It doesn't have the side effects of spironolactone, specifically the gynecomastia and the breast tenderness that people shy away from using that. Eplerinone can be used instead of that. Peripheral alpha blockers can be considered if the beta blocker that you chose doesn't have an alpha blockade effect. Direct vasodilating agents or centrally acting agents like clonidine should ideally be the last resort. So can we predict which add-on drug might work best? Now, when we have all these choices, can we actually um, look at a patient and say, OK, this is probably going to work better for this patient? Now, traditionally, we have gone with a hypertension phenotype, you know, um, young, old, black, white. There are certain medications that work better in those. Now, the other things that can potentially be done, all the controversial, are one, measurement of plasma renin activity, easy enough to do. Um, if the renin is low, that means that the volume is high. They go in opposite directions. Low renin means high volume. So you treat with a diuretic. If the renin is high, you use something that would decrease the renin, the ACE, ARB, or beta blocker. Again, there's a lot of controversy, and some people don't believe in doing this, but this is something um, that can be considered in patients with resistant hypertension, at least to guide you in the decision to add on uh, one medication versus the other. One thing we do in our hypertension lab is non-invasive hemodynamic measurements. Now, this, as it says, is non-invasive, and patients come in for about an hour, and we get uh, non-invasive measures of cardiac index, systemic vascular resistance, and the thoracic fluid content. So if, if their systemic vascular resistance is high, we can preferentially use vasodilators. If, they're, if, if we find that their volume is in excess, increase their diuretics. So this is something that we do in our hypertension lab that sometimes guides us in management. So experimental therapies. I'll just show you one slide on this. Um, there's two that, are, that you may have heard about. One is baroreflex activation therapy, and the other is renal denervation, both of which try to decrease the sympathetic system or the sympathetic activity. And renal denervation especially has uh, created quite a buzz, uh, the simplicity trials. Simplicity 1 and 2 have shown an average decrease of 32 by 12 points uh, decrease in systolic blood pressures. The way it is done, as shown in the diagram, it's a catheter-based procedure. You go into the renal arteries and ablate the renal nerves in the circumference of the artery. So, uh, and it's, it, nothing's left inside. It's, it's a 45-minute to one-hour procedure. And studies in Europe have shown significant decreases that are persistent up to three years. Now, in the U.S., this is not available. It was available as part of a trial called the Simplicity 3. We were enrolling in it. We have completed enrollment. Data analysis is ongoing. The FDA may approve it towards the end of next year. So until then, this is not clinically available, but this is something in the future that you can consider in your patients. Now, to summarize, a step-by-step -step guide, one, exclude factors that cause apparent resistance. Proper measurement, exclude a white coat effect um, as best as you can try to assess compliance, identify any target organ involvement because patients with apparent resistance generally don't have any target organ damage. Reverse factors contributing to true resistance, uh, any pharmacologic agents, especially NSAIDs, that may increase blood pressures. Lifestyle factors, evaluate for presence of kidney disease, whether it's low GFR or proteinuria, secondary workup as indicated, neurohemoral, like renin levels, or hemodynamic profile, what I talked about, the BioZ as guide to therapy, which, uh, which usually requires uh, a referral to a hypertension specialist. Pharmacologic principles, I went over some of the medications, inappropriate dosing, suboptimal dosing, inappropriate combinations are pretty much the most common causes of um, lack of response to therapy. 
appropriate diuretics should be used. Ultimately, you decide what's best for the patient based on patient characteristics. Now, when to refer? Now, the guideline is if therapy has progressed to needing a fourth agent, ideally, you should refer to a hypertension specialist. Obviously, there are other reasons you would refer to, you know, if patients are not tolerating medications or you need any kind of help, you probably would refer to a hypertension specialist. But especially if therapy has progressed to needing a fourth agent, JNC recommends referral to a hypertension specialist. I just want to close with two cases. Uh, the first case is a 58-year-old male engineer who was referred for resistant hypertension, diabetic for five years, hypertensive for 12 years, no coronary disease or stroke, seated office blood pressures, 168 over 94, similar in both arms. Now, let me bring up that point. At least when a patient comes in for their first visit, check blood pressures on both arms to see if there's a significant discrepancy on both sides and follow the arm um, with the higher blood pressures. Not orthostatic, heart rate is low, BMI is 32, exam as seen with some S4, uh, there's some target organ uh, involvement, S4 is present, some eye changes, no edema, no brewy, EKG fits LVH, urine was unremarkable, no protein, labs as you can see, fairly normal, strong family history of hypertension, non-smoker drinks one glass of wine. Now the medications of interest, what he's on right now, or what he came to us with, was hydrochlorothiazide, Valsartan, Felodipine, Clonidine, Metoprolol, and Aleve. Complaints include fatigue and dry mouth. Notes daytime sleepiness and wife notes snoring. Now the fatigue and dry mouth could very well be the clonidine that is known to cause sedation and dry mouth. Um, another medication that could cause fatigue is beta blockers. So just keep that in mind. And then uh, obviously he may fit the phenotype for obstructive sleep apnea. So let's go through those things that we talked about in the step-by-step -step evaluation. Proper measurement. We do the automated office BP, the average of five readings confirmed that it's high. We did not do an ABPM because he brought in his home machine. We checked his machine. He demonstrated correct technique. There was no real reason to suspect any discrepancy between home readings and office readings. So ABPM was not done. Uh, but you could potentially consider that if there is discrepancy or some uh, variation in measurements between home and office. Target organ involvement, there were some eye changes, there was LVH. And in this person, necessary, there was no reason to suspect noncompliance. Now, what are the factors contributing to resistance in him? Stop his NSAIDs. He was taking a leave for a long time. We asked him to stop it. Uh, diet was reviewed. He does not add salt. This is one of the common things that patients say. I don't add salt. That's great, but they may be eating all kinds of processed foods and eating out often. That definitely bumps up your sodium intake. So we reviewed low sodium diet with him, alcohol counsel to limit to no more than two drinks a day. Now that's the recommendation from JNC, males two drinks per day, women one drink per day. He was just drinking one glass of wine, so he wasn't um, an alcoholic or anything. Uh, physical activity and weight loss, again, lifestyle changes. Uh, normal kidney function, no proteinuria. Would you work up for secondary causes? Um, in this patient, there was no reason to suspect anything. I probably would have done a renin to guide therapy, as I discussed before, but he already had secondary causes done. He had normal metanephrins, normal duplex, and the renin, uh, although that were normal. Now remember, if the metanephrins, do not check a VMA if you suspect VO. Metanephrins and catecholamines in the plasma should be the first step. VMA is no longer um, advised for uh, pheochromocytoma. And we decided to get a sleep study. So what about the medication? Hydrochlorothiazide 25, we switched it to chlorothalidone. Valsartan 160, we decided to continue that. Felodipine 10, amlodipine has been shown to be better than felodipine, we switched that. Metoprolol, well, oh, clonidine, let me get to that. We started a clonidine taper because of his fatigue and dry mouth. Metoprolol maybe was contributing to some fatigue. He was bradycardic, so we decided to decrease the dose. He started CPAP for his obstructive sleep apnea, stopped his NSAIDs. He had a weight loss of seven pounds. Low sodium diet, but it's difficult when he travels, uh, which is often. Clonidine was tapered off. Next visit, his blood pressure, a little bit better, but still high, heart rate of 60, and still notes fatigue. Uh, we discussed addition of the fourth agent at this point, either spironolactone or Inspra, eplerinone. He decided to go with eplerinone because of the side effects of spironolactone. Um, and we uh, started that at a dose of 50 milligrams. You can divide it as a 25-25 dose. And we stopped the metoprolol because he still had that fatigue. Return blood pressures, 122 or 88. Great response. Heart rate of 72. 
Follow-up labs, creatinine of 1.3 and potassium of 4.2, he feels well. At this point, he's on four drugs. One thing I want to caution is, if you remember, he's also on the valsartan, and he's on spermolactone. This is a combination that you have to not worry about, but keep a close eye, because there is a risk for hyperkalemia. Now, the next step, really, would be to get him off of his valsartan, hopefully, if he's able to tolerate that. But if you have them on a combination of that, make sure the potassium is closely monitored. One more case, this was a 40-year-old female who was referred from outside the U.S. for resistant hypertension and actually for consideration of renal denervation, which we talked about. She was reportedly diagnosed at the age of 34, well-controlled until a year ago. She was seen by multiple specialists, actually in two different countries before she came here. Battery of tests already done. Seated off his blood pressures, same in both arms, 198 over 102. Not orthostatic, 105. Exam as indicated, urine analysis was fine, EKG with LBH, labs, as you see. Strong family, of hist uh, family history of hypertension, non-smoker, non no alcohol. Very unusual regimen of medication. This is what she came with. This is documented on a letter from a country. Aliskirin, amlodipine, indapamide. Now, indapamide is a thiazide diuretic that is um, commonly used in Europe, and I'm assuming she was put on that when she was seen there. Telmisartan, spironolactone, labetalol, clonidine as needed, and nasal decongestant. So she's on one, two, three, four, five, six medications, plus a seventh medication as needed, and still blood pressures are high. Very unusual regimen because she's on a direct renin inhibitor, she's on spironolactone, she's on telmisartan, all of which act on the same pathway. Ideally, it should not be done. Confirmed resistance, so automated off his blood pressure. Average of five readings, high, we confirmed that. She doesn't do home BP readings. So we did an ABPM, it was still high. Target organ involvement, she did have white changes, LBH. Non-compliance, you start suspecting non-compliance in this patient. Six medications, seven medications, blood pressure sky high with an unusual regimen. Reverse factors, well, um, that nasal decongestant can raise blood pressures, although I doubt that that was causing everything, but stop it. Diet reviewed, she claims a low-sodium diet, but remember she had a battery of tests done, and a previous 24-hour urine showed a sodium of 250 milliequivalents. She was definitely taking more sodium than she claimed to be. So we talked about low-sodium diet. She had a normal kidney function. Workups, uh, secondary causes, again, done twice in the past. Uh, no FIO, no renal artery stenosis, renin and aldor, fine, normal TSH and cortisol. So again, as we said, unusual regimen of medications. We decided to do that hemodynamic study, the non-invasive study called the BioZ. Uh, we found that she had a high systemic vascular resistance despite being on vasodilating agents. Uh, it was also suggestive of volume excess. Now we decided to change her regimen altogether. We decided to switch to chlorthalidone, nifedipine, and Coreg. Now again, Coreg is not first line, but we decided to go with it because she was so tachycardic. There was no reason for her to be in for whatever reason, we can argue, but we decided to go with that. Persistently elevated office blood pressures, she was coming almost every other day to the office, um, and after one week or 10 days, we decided enough is enough. We're gonna admit her and watch what's going on. Now, on the second day of admissions, on the same regimen, her blood pressures in the 140s to 150s, just one isolated high rating, heart rate in the 70s to 80s. She was discharged on that regimen. Comes back one week later, Blood pressure is 179 over 100 again. We decided to add lisinopril, and at that point, we decided she needs a diuretic screen. It resulted as negative. So she wasn't taking medications, or she was, maybe she was taking it on and off, but it, it was non-compliance all the way. So she, this is a lady, so the final diagnosis would be primary hypertension. There was no evidence of secondary causes, difficulty in control with excess sodium intake, and medication non-compliance. Again, to emphasize, when would you suspect medication non-compliance? They come in on a very unusual regimen. Does the regimen make sense? Um, labetalol, very high doses. She was taking 300 TID and her heart rate was in the hundreds. And she improved on observed administration. So that's another clue that when she was in the hospital and when we actually asked the nurses to make sure that they're actually taking it and swallowing it. Because we have had patients who pocket their pills in the mouth and spit it out. We have had all kinds of people. So, so this can happen. So this is something to keep in mind. Now, let me end with, so we have a resistant hypertension clinic. Uh, if you need help with managing some of your patients, um, this is the line, this is the number that can be called. Um, they will ask a few questions, and uh, there's a few, uh, a few of us who see patients with resistant hypertension, and they'll schedule them with us. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>